Order. Order. Uh, it's order, please. Members take their seats. It's now time for questions to the Minister for uh, of Justice, and we will start with listed questions. Uh, I call Linda Dillon. Minister. A wide-ranging training programme has been put in place for all newly appointed custody prison officers. This nine-week programme has been developed with rehabilitation as its focus. In line with my priorities as Minister, equipping new staff with the necessary knowledge to assist those in custody to positively change. During the training, staff are taught how to challenge appropriately, signpost to services and assist those committed into our care. They are taught how to engage with each individual prisoner in terms of their risks, needs and strengths. Within one year, staff successfully completing the training requirements will receive a certificate of competence. In August this year, the prison service promoted 43 new uh, senior officers across the three establishments, and a new training programme has been developed for these staff, which places rehabilitation at the centre of everything they do, and that will be delivered in November. This will equip these new managers with a rehabilitative approach and knowledge of the skills required of both them and their staff. For staff and prisoner development units, which deliver rehabilitation on a daily basis, a range of training such as risk assessment, desistance and interventions is provided to equip staff with the necessary skills to assist prisoner rehabilitation. Delivery of this training is in partnership with the Probation Service, the Public Pro uh, Protection Unit, the PSNI and other key agencies. I am committed to having in place training arrangements for new and exist existing prison staff, which empowers and enables them to work positively with prisoners to assist in their rehabilitation and thus contribute to making Northern Ireland safer. Thank you. Linda Dillon. The Minister, thank you for your answer, Minister. The Minister will be aware that it is now widely accepted that the prison officer engagement with prisoners is the first stage in the rehabilitation process. However, in the past there was a policy in prisons here of non-engagement and concerns have been raised that such a culture may still exist among some prison staff. Can the minister give an assurance that she will raise this issue with the new director of prisons when he or she is appointed? I thank the member for her supplementary. Um, indeed, moving forward, I think the fact that we're putting rehabilitation at the focus in terms of our training of new uh, custody day officers and senior officers should certainly ensure that there is a real sense of engagement in order to rehabilitate. Um, I have done a number of visits around our uh, prison establishment within the estate. Certainly, I don't see that sense of disengagement amongst prison staff and prisoners. But, however, I take the point. I think moving forward, if you believe it to be an issue in terms of the people that you represent, I'm quite happy to raise it with the new Director General when he or she is in post. Thank you. I call Doug Biddy. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if I could, could ask, please, uh, given the challenging nature of uh, supervision and delivery uh, of rehabilitation, does the Justice Minister believe that a staff level of 31 officers at Her Majesty's Prison McGabbery of 870 inmates for overnight supervision, including the periodic monitoring of up to 25 prisoners at risk, is not only inadequate, but is not appropriate given the recent Ombudsman's report on Sean Lynch? Minister. I uh, thank the member for his uh, question. And indeed, I, I, I do recognise that there are challenges within our prison service, some of which you've alluded to. Um, certainly moving forward, I'm keen to look at those challenges and see, first and foremost, how we can better support our prison officers uh, within the, the environment. Working within a prison, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is a challenging environment. It really is like no other. And I'm certainly keen to look at how we can better support uh, prison officers. And that might be some of the suggestions that he's included. So I think uh, when we get the new Director General in post, we, we will look forward to, to, to having those discussions. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank uh, the Minister for her answers um, so far. Can I ask the Minister, does she recognise the, the exceptional needs of both um, prisoners and indeed prison service staff? And I hear alluding to that already, and I welcome that, um, by way of mental health care in particular. Um, and does she agree that mental health issues need to be addressed in order to assist in prisoner rehabilitation? Thank the member for her uh, supplementary. Um, by all means, yes. Uh, mental health issues right across all public services are something that I think we need to give focus to. Um, I, I think there is a certain legacy with the fact that we are a post-conflict society that a lot of people who may have been either directly or indirectly affected by the trauma of the Troubles are now realising that in their retirement years when they have more time to think because they don't have the distractions of a job. Um, in coming back to my, um, my own uh, interest area, yes, by all means, both prison officers and 
prisoners uh, within prison. I think it's been said to me that a quarter of my prisoners um, have mental health issues, and that's something we need to look at. Do we need to look at the prison estate? Is it fit for purpose? How we're actually interacting with prisoners on a day-in, day basis? But by all means, I can't do this alone, um, and it's something that I'm keen to work with with the health minister, um, within the executive, um, and we've already had discussions around how we can tackle mental health issues, particularly within prisons, but also uh, to, to support staff too. I call Alex Adwood. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister and all members will be very aware of the distressing prisoner ombudsman report that was published in the first week in September. Can the Minister confirm that she's called in prison management in respect of that report? What did you say to them if you did meet with them? And how will you ensure that the 63 recommendations uh, in that report will be fully, quickly and faithfully implemented? I uh, thank uh, the member for his question. Um, I don't shy away from the fact that that was a damning report. Um, and certainly there were a number of recommendations that as, a, as an organisation, the Northern Ireland Prison Service, along with the South Eastern Trust, will be looking at because whilst those recommendations were put forward, it's, it's recommendations for both organisations working together. Um, I, I have had a conversation about it and I think moving forward, we do need to look at staff training. Um, in, in respect of this particular case, this was an exceptional, exceptional mental health case, but and to be honest, our officers were not equipped to deal with that exceptional case. But moving forward into the future, we need to look how we can better equip officers to deal with these sorts of cases. So yes, I, I think um, it, it's severe lessons that have been learned from that. And moving forward, I ensure that, that we do. Call Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Minister, could you tell us what your target is for the level of resourcing for the prison service for employment and skills and for health and well-being? Um, I, I thank the member for his question. Certainly, I think moving forward, I'm quite keen to look at how we can modernise uh, the prison service so that we can actually look at the needs of prison officers. Um, you know, w w thankfully, we're having more women uh, coming to work within the prison service. We'll have to look at their needs, their family needs. Um, I, I think we, we also need to look at how we can better support them. Um, uh, just in terms of the shift patterns even perhaps. So I, I think the new modernisation programme that we're looking at, um, I'm reluctant to say in terms of figures, I think that's what the members are uh, trying to get at, uh, Deputy Speaker, but I think it needs to be a wider review of we, how we can better support prison officers moving forward. Thank you. I call Mr Andy Allen. Question to Deputy, Deputy Speaker. Minister. Uh, my department leads on the delivery of the executive commitment uh, contained in the TBOC strategy in respect of the removal of peace walls by 2023 and is seeking to bring about the conditions that can enable people to support their removal. I would remind executive colleagues of the importance of supporting delivery through the work of their departments. At the outset of this work, dating back to the last programme for government commitment, my department was responsible for 59 structures situated in Belfast, Portadown, Lurgan and Londonderry. To date, nine structures have been removed completely, along with parts of four others. Within the TBOC interface programme, we are also in, uh, incorporate structures belonging to the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. The reduction in the number of structures has only been possible through effective partnership working between departments, statutory agencies, the voluntary and community sector, and communities themselves. I must, however, note the difficulty in establishing effective partnership working whilst working within the current annual budget cycles. I do recognise that in many respects, current financial planning cycles are outside our control. Nevertheless, I would echo the views of our key delivery partners that a long-term funding model is needed for good, delivery and effect, uh, good planning and an effective delivery. I fully recognise the challenges that remain around the removal of peace walls. They are multifaceted, and that is why we have established a programme board comprising relevant departments and agencies, which is responsible for providing advice at a strategic level with particular focus on four key areas social, community, physical, and economic uh, regeneration. Thank you. Uh, Andy Allen. I thank the Minister for her answer. Minister, can you advise what work your department is take, undertaking alongside your uh, executive colleagues to support and assist those living on the peace lines? I uh, thank uh, Mr. Allen for his uh, supplementary and indeed question. Um, yeah, I, I think we're, we're working together to establish a solution to this problem. You know that ultimately it will not be this executive that will bring down peace walls; it will be the communities themselves. And I think it's important that they are part of the conversations in doing so. There's a, there's a lot of issue around the peace walls. Some people are almost looking at them in terms of a safety blanket, in terms of a comfort. But I, I think um, what I'm keen to do is to get out onto the ground and ask my department, department officials to do that also to work with the various agencies. As I alluded to, you know, there, there, there's also interest with the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. Um, uh, the local PCSPs also have an input here. Um, but 
first and foremost, the communities that are living you know, around these, these walls. So I think um, to, to answer your question more specifically, we're, we're working together and we're going to try and you know, do what we can to, 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 in terms of working towards our 2023 target. Thank you. I call Nicola Mallon. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, given that paramilitarism has often been the context and the backdrop against which many of the peace walls have been built, can the Minister confirm how many times the cross-departmental cross board chaired by Justice has met since the Executive published an action plan to address paramilitary activity on the 19th of July? Minister. Um, uh, regrettably, I don't have that figure to hand, but what I will say is that um, this forms part of the wider working that we have in terms of the paramilitary uh, action we have in terms of ending that. Um, and yes, you, know, you, you do allude, allude to a very difficult uh, challenge in terms of trying to move this work forward. Um, I, I do say that I have spoken with communities around these areas, and there is a sense uh, of fear amongst that. And it's, it's how do we work through that? Um, I'm of the mind, though, that we have to speak to these individuals. They have to be part of the process. Um, and certainly it's something uh, uh, I, I'm keen to do as part of the wider uh, uh, tackling paramilitary ter terrorism, but also the Peace Wall target for 2023. Thank you. I call Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for answers uh, thus far. M Minister, on Sunday night, I spoke to a group um, of young students from um, John Brown University in Arkansas, and the question they asked me was, "How do we take these peace walls down?" My answer to them, and I'm sure I'm just going to ask the minister, would she agree that the most important people we need to talk to are the people who are living in those areas? I live one mile from the peace line. But I may, may as, well, as well live in Arkansas. So I'll ask the Minister, would she agree the key people in all this are the people who are living on the interface? Minister. Um, certainly, and in, in my response to Mr. Allen, you know, I, I agree ultimately that the people that will take these walls down are the people that live in that area. But we need to provide them with the support so that they, they feel supported in bringing them down, so that they don't have that fear. It's such an intractable issue, particularly in some areas. But you know, I, that's why I'm keen with other departments to, to really engage within the communities, but also the various agencies as well in terms of community involvement groups and the people that they are representing them. I, say, you know, I, I would put a challenge onto the rest of this house. You know, it, it, it's a responsibility there as community representatives, as political representatives, that you play your part in trying to solve this. This won't be my job alone. Thank you. I advise members at question 11 has been withdrawn. I call Mr Morris Bradley. Uh, question 3, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, an outline business case for the redevelopment of McGilligan Prison was approved by the Department of Finance in January 2015. Project delivery is dependent on the provision of capital funding. This will be considered as part of the process of setting the next budget. Um, I will not, unfortunately, be able to confirm when the rebuilding of McGilligan will uh, commence until capital funding is secured, though I am fully committed to providing a redeveloped uh, prison at McGilligan to enable the Northern Ireland Prison Service to deliver essential programmes to address reoffending behaviour, to meet Disability Discrimination Act standards, and to replace the existing infrastructure, which has outlived its useful purpose and is expensive and inefficient to staff, maintain and operate. I call Mr Jerry Mullen. Sorry. Supplementary for Mr Bradley. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister, for that response. Uh, you have apparently uh, answered the next question. How soon will the new prison start and how long will it take you to build it? And you have no idea, have you? How long is a piece of string? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mm, um, it would be uh, remiss of me to say that I have no idea. Um, but but, uh, but by, by all means, um, the building work will start when we can secure capital funding. If that were to happen soon, for example, then I would expect a fully uh, developed prison to be delivered by 25-26. Thank you. Now it's Mr Jerry Mullen. Mr Speaker. Minister, um, you'll be aware that there's a great need for a new build for McGilligan Prison, uh, which would not only benefit the, the, the prisoners and the, the staff, but it would also benefit the local construction industry and would be a valuable asset to the local economy in general. Uh, so, would you agree that the business case is already approved by the Department of Finance and that the project is already shovel ready? And what assurances can you give that you will be knocking on the door of the Finance Minister to ensure that additional capital funding will be sought for this development? Minister. Thank you. 
Um, I, I thank the member for his uh, questions. Um, I think the member can be assured that I, more than anyone, am quite keen to see this uh, bill go ahead. Um, and indeed, you have alluded to an approved business uh, uh, case, which will go forward when capital funding is secured. Um, yes, I agree to the comments um, around the manufacturing uh, industry. This is a very significant uh, project. But you know, I, I think, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's pointing out that this is an invest-to-save project as well. So you know, when, when we do f uh, finally get a fully developed prison we will actually see savings because of it. Um, it will make it safer for uh, prison staff too and to be able to fully carry out their programmes of rehabilitation that we've talked about earlier in, in question time. So no, I, I am committed to ensuring that we move forward in this project when capital investment is secured. I call Kiva Archibald. I'm Margaret Lish and I'd like to thank the Minister for her answers. Um, can the Minister outline what arrangements will be made to accommodate the needs of prisoners with mental health issues, autism and ADHD through this project? Um, uh, thank uh, the member for her question. Um, yes, I think I, I talked around um, the, the conversation of mental health earlier in question time, but you know, you also alluded to other areas such as ADHD and autism, which I think needs to be consideration of people coming into the criminal justice system. Um, indeed, we're at the very early stages of trying to understand what that looks like for the prison service. Um, but um, certainly, if, if it forms part of even our modernisation programme amongst prison officers, if there's opportunities for them to develop to better understand the needs of prisoners, perhaps in these areas, it's something that we're going to look at. You know, I think the opportunity now is how we can move forward in understanding the best needs of both prisoners and prison officers. Thank you. David Ford. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. A few years ago, the then Minister of Finance and Personnel praised the prison service for the work they had done planning capital build, not just for McGilligan, but also for McGabry and for the women's facility at Hyde Bank. Can I congratulate the Minister on having cut the first sod for a new building uh, at McGabry, but ask her if she's any news on the women's facility at Hyde Bank, even if she's no news on McGilligan? Minister. I thank the, the member for his question. Um, as, as the member will be fully informed, um, this, uh, the, the new build at McGilligan is part of a wider redevelopment process, and certainly the first phase in that is the redevelopment at McGilligan. Um, so I, I will look forward to uh, cutting the first sod in that, hopefully very soon, but again, subject to capital in, investment, and then uh, we can proceed with plans in other areas. So, thank you. I call Mr. Declan McTeer, McAleer. Come on, let's call you a with your hard question for. Uh, tackling domestic and sexual violence and abuse is a key priority for me as Justice Minister. I am committing, uh, committed to ensuring that victims who are encouraged to engage with the criminal justice system are provided with effective protection and support and that perpetrators are held to account. I believe there is a desire uh, across the executive to address this issue, which has been evidenced by the all-party group on domestic violence and also by the support from the Justice Committee. And I look forward to working with colleagues to do, uh, uh, in moving forward on this. <laughs> Um, I commend the approach uh, in Derry in delivering special listing arrangements for domestic violence cases. These arrangements, introduced by uh, District Judge Michael Holm in 2011, ensure that domestic violence cases are clustered and heard by him on specifically designated days. Relevant agencies, including the support services, concentrate their efforts and resources into those days in order to provide moral and practical support to victims. An evaluation of the scheme undertaken in 2014 indicated that the arrangement makes a tangible dif difference to the victims of domestic violence and abuse and who have to face what is often a daunting and overwhelming journey through the criminal justice process. Some improvements to support uh, services available to victims were identified and in March this year my uh, predecessor announced that arrangements should be enhanced before further consideration is given to the rolling out of the programme or the model across other areas in Northern Ireland. The London Dairy listing arrangement also formed part of the study undertaken by the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development in June 2015 as part of the Public Governance Review. Their report heralds the success of the domestic violence listing arrangement and recommends the inclusion of a judici judicially supervised pilot programme for perpetrators. Rigorous monitoring and evaluation will provide insight into the added value of judicial oversight as part of the domestic violence listing arrangement and inform future decisions on the most effective model for dealing with domestic violence cases within the court system. My department is therefore taking the necessary steps to enhance the existing domestic violence listing arrangement through the introduction of a pilot court supervised perpetrator program and I have already met with the Lord Chief Justice Sir Declan Morgan in my role as Justice Minister and will continue to engage with him and other stakeholders as I look to the future of this specific arrangement and seeking more widely to address the issues of domestic and sexual violence and abuse in Northern Ireland. 
Remind the Minister of the two-minute rule, uh, Mr McAleer. Um, I thank the Minister for her extensive answer. Um, does the Minister believe that uh, domestic violence courts will encourage and empower more victims to take action? And if the pilot is ruled out, would her department be minded to engage in a public awareness campaign to make people aware that this option is available for them? Graham Abbott. I, I thank the member for his answer. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the arrangement that we see in Derry has been very successful, and certainly um, when we look at the new enhancements that we're going to uh, put towards this arrangement, you know, it, we may be minded to see if that would be appropriate to roll out across Northern Ireland. Um, I do take the member's point about a wider public awareness programme. If I'm really honest, before becoming the minister, I wasn't aware of this arrangement in Derry, probably thankfully. But, I think you're right, people are, will be encouraged to come uh, forward uh, to, to report these um, offences if they are better su supported. It's, it's a challenging thing uh, to, to stand up in court, particularly if you are a, a victim of this and give evidence, and it, it has been seen that there is a reluctance to do so, whereas in a supportive environment we're seeing an increase of people coming forward, and that can only be a good thing. Thank you. Lord Morrow. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I've been asking questions around this issue dating back as far as 2011. I asked then about this issue. I asked the then Minister again uh, in January 2011, or sorry, in June 2011. I asked him two questions in relation. I asked him again another question in 2015, very similar to the, the early one in 2011. I'm tempted to ask the Minister the same question again. Uh, because the Minister said then that he, he notes that a positive evaluation of these arrangements has recently been completed, which recommends that these measures and initiatives are introduced in other courts officials from the Department of Northern Ireland Tribunals. Sir. Yes, um, well, I thought you'd say that. Uh, but can I ask the Minister how long an evaluation on this takes? We're now into nearly six years. Do we have to wait another six? Uh, uh, thank the member for his inference. No, I, I, I would hope that you don't have to uh, wait another six years. I would like to get work done a little bit quicker than that. Um, but you know, to, to be fair to my predecessor, in terms of the pilot arrangement in Derry, um, th there were issues around um, how we can better support victims that came out of the, OC the OECD report, and he recommended that perhaps we could further enhance the arrangements under the pilot scheme so that it, we can see if it is appropriate to roll out across Northern Ireland. But we are looking at that. As I said, this is my overarching priority for the next five years. If I can go some way into tackling this issue, I think we could solve a lot of social economic problems across Northern Ireland. So, yes, I, I, I hope it will be a lot sooner than six years. Well, Jenny Palmer. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, given the uh, particular effects and coercive nature of domestic violence, can I confirm with the Minister that there are no instances of individuals convicted of domestic violence taking part in the Enhanced Combination Order pilot, which was started last October? Minister. Um, I, I, I thank the, the member for her question, and um, indeed I, she, she alludes to uh, coercive control. Um, and my department had recently undertaken a public consultation which sought the views on whether a specific domestic abuse offence to capture patterns of coercive and controlling behaviour um, should be introduced in law, um, whilst I'll want to consult with uh, the Justice Committee and sort of wider engagement with the community and voluntary sector on this. Um, I am uh, minded to move forward on this issue. Thank you. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, in a recent briefing paper given to me by the research team here at the Assembly, um, it shows that while the total number of homicides have fallen in Northern Ireland over the past few years, those with a domestic abuse motivation have remained relatively constant to the point that where we now have in 2008, 16 point 7% of cases were female victims, yet in 2014 that proportion had risen to just over 41%. Um, it's good to hear the plans to take this issue seriously, to extend the implementation question, of the courts. Could the Minister please say what else initiatives um, she will be addressing as a matter of absolute urgency um, for domestic violence victims? I thank the member for her question. Um, the, the member had alluded to uh, domestic homicides, and uh, my department had previously explored the issue of domestic homicide reviews by setting up a working group to scope serious case reviews already in place across relevant departments and agencies and to consider initial options for delivery. It was agreed that further work was required to ensure that a proposed model would be suitable for Northern Ireland and would link in the complex context of reviews identified. 
DOJ therefore has committed under the action plan for the new stopping uh, domestic and sexual violence and abuse strategy to develop an appropriate model to identify lessons learned and improve response to cases of domestic homicide in Northern Ireland. Work has commenced and additional resources have been secured to progress this initiative. Um, but I suppose to, to come back to what else we can do, um, I'm, very, I'm very much at the beginning of a five-year mandate. Um, it's an area that I really do have quite a passion for and, and I'm keen to address. Um, a lot of the work that has been uh, done up to now perhaps what was already ongo ongoing from my predecessor's work. What I'm really keen to do in the next five years is really engage with the community and voluntary sector on this and try and get suggestions, look at other jurisdictions to see you know, what we can do in this. Um, and I, I'm open to those suggestions and indeed and I know the member has a specific interest in this. So I'd be keen if she has any ideas if we could meet and we could discuss this. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mr Philip Logan. Please, Deputy Speaker. Minister. Um, I understand that the working group on fatal fetal abnormality has met on three occasions. It has carried out um, additional engaging work. The group is aiming to report to the Health Minister and myself by the end of September. Mr Logan. Uh, does the Minister agree with me that it is important to have this discussion around an atmosphere of respect and that, that, that people don't have uh, their viewpoints misrepresented, misrep misrepresented like we've seen in the past? Thank you. Minister? Um, yes, I entirely agree with that point. You know, I, um, I think this is, a, a, is an entirely emotive issue, and certainly, as, and the member won't be familiar with this, we, ha we had a very long uh, debate where I, I think actually quite a respectful debate around um, this issue um, bef before the election. Um, but yes, of course, you know, people need to be heard um, in, in terms of this wider issue. But in respect of the fatal fetal abnormality in the working group, the purpose of that group was set up to, to hear a viewpoint from practitioners um, and experts in this uh, particular medical field. So uh, while I wouldn't uh, want to uh, assume what recommendations they, that might uh, come out of the, that working group next uh, week. Um, I will await along with the Health Minister to see how we can potentially move forward. Well, Declan Turney. Can call you. Uh, thank you, Minister. Minister, have you had any discussions with the Minister for Health in relation to the ongoing promotion of equality and human rights for women? And specifically, uh, with regard to ensuring that women are not being denied timely uh, and suitable prenatal testing in relation to fatal fetal abnormalities. Minister. I, I thank the member for his question. I'm sure the member will be fully aware that prenatal uh, care for women um, in these situations would be fully a matter for the health minister. But um, I have uh, worked with the health minister on this issue and seeing how we can progress it because whilst the, the the legal aspects of this will fall within my jurisdiction, there is a concern from, from a health um, uh, perspective that, that she'd be involved as well. Uh, I call Steve Aiken. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, given the recent resignation of the paediatric pathologist, Dr Gannon, over the interventions by Northern Ireland's Attorney General on, on issues surrounding the fetal fetal abnormality, does the Justice Minister believe there is a case that the Attorney General's beliefs may have interfered with his professional impartiality on this issue? rendering his position based on this judgment potentially untenable. Minister. Uh, I thank the member for his question. Um, my understanding is the role of the Attorney General is to provide legal advice to the Northern Ireland Executive, but um, I, I would imagine that any minister worth their salt would take a range of views when considering this type of issue. Um, the Attorney General, uh, the member will know, is entirely independent, um, and the decisions he takes is, is within his gift and within his gift only. But certainly, I know from my perspective, um, when I'm balancing up an issue that, that ultimately affects the people of Northern Ireland, I will consider a wide range of uh, views that have been put to me, so it won't be just in terms of one it won't, be, it won't be for the opportunity of one person to influence me. Thank you. I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, um, Minister. Thank you for your answers to date. Um, can you guarantee that the report from the working group will be published promptly once the review is concluded to ensure full transparency? Uh, I thank the, the uh, member for her answer. Um, the, the working group will report to the health minister and myself and will provide a number of recommendations in respect of this particular area. Um, it will be then up to the, the health minister and myself to f find out how we can uh, f find a way of moving forward because this will not be mine or the health minister's decision alone. Any legislative change, if that's what is being recommended, will have to go, uh, go through the acceptance of the wider executive. <coughs> Quick question from Jim Allister. Uh, could the Minister tell us something of the composition of the Working Party and can she assure the House that it's not made up solely of clinicians and other personnel 
with a predisposed preference for termination as the answer? Minister, response. Yeah. Um, I, I thank the, the member for his answer. Um, the, the purpose of the working group was to take um, a, an expert view on this particular area. So it, it is made up of uh, a, a public medical professionals from, from that respect. Um, I, I don't think anyone is predisposed in this. The, the, the purpose of this was to be entirely informed on this issue uh, in the most appropriate way. Okay, that ends the period of listed questions. We now move on to topical questions. I call Mr. Doug Biddy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, earlier this month, uh, the Lord Chief Justice gave his opening uh, of the legal year address, and, and I know the Minister uh, was present. Uh, during that address, he outlined his proposals that the judicial system uh, should become a non ministerial um, department. Uh, can I ask the Justice Minister uh, for her opinion? Uh, on the Lord Chief Justice's proposal for a non-ministerial department. Minister. Uh, I, I thank the member for his question, and, and yes, I am familiar with um, uh, the Lord Chief uh, Justice uh, wishes around the non-ministerial department. It, it's something that we're actually working quite closely with the Lord Chief Justice on to try and understand, I suppose, the, the, the advantages and disadvantages of what he's asking for. Um, by all means, I do respect entirely the, the independence of the judiciary, um, but, you know, Sometimes you need to be careful what you wish for in this respect. You know, it's by all means if the Lord Chief Justice is keen to take this off my hand and he knows the, the repercussions of doing so, something I'm you know quite happy to look at. It's not something I'm particularly against. Mr. Biddy. Uh, I thank the Minister for, for her answer. Um, could I just, just ask to, 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 to move that forward? Have you actually engaged with the, the judicial uh, executive group that the, the Lord Chief Justice ha, has set up to promote that idea of a, of a, a, a non ministerial department and, in fact, sees it as a conduit now uh, for, for working between the various different justice departments? Minister. Um, I have not engaged specifically with that group, but I do have regular meetings with the Lord Chief Justice, and it is an issue that he has raised with me. Um, it seems to be very, uh, very much at the early stages in terms of the thinking around it, but you know, I'm quite happy to have those discussions through the Lord Chief Justice and indeed the group, if that's what he, uh, he wishes in terms of how we can move forward, if, if that's the most appropriate thing to do. Mr. Jonathan Bell. Can I ask the uh, Minister for the assessment of the Department of Justice of the adequacy of our legislation? Uh, in relation to online sexual abuse? Minister. Um, I, I thank the member for his question. And indeed, it's, it's a very topical issue, particularly um, uh, for uh, some of the, the recent news reports around it. Um, I think widely, you know, we, we don't seem to uh, have an entire focus on the pitfalls of, of the internet and in terms of what that can do, from an abuse point of view, most uh, uh, critically, but also the wider um, uh, cybercrime against businesses and all of that. Um, I, I recently um, uh, met at a, 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 a organised crime task force group, and it was raised to me um, about uh, the, the pitfalls of the internet and, and, and how that's can be used to exploit children, but also exploit people generally in, in, in terms of uh, financial fraud and, and various issues. So it's something that I'm keen to pick a f uh, put a focus on because you know, I, I do actually think in Northern Ireland we're behind in our thinking on you know, the dangers of the internet. Um, and when we get to a point where we feel we're comfortable, we'll probably be behind again. So it's something that I think we need to have a keen eye on as soon as possible. Mr. Bell. I can I thank the Minister uh, for that level of focus and attention, and would you agree with me that the trends are very worrying indeed. Some, across our UK, I think there's been a 21 per cent rise, according to the NSPCC, and in Northern Ireland, uh, there seems some 160 calls, which, would you agree with me, indicates that we need to keep this very much a watching brief. Yes, um, of course, I, you know, I entirely agree. This is a very, very worrying trend. And it seems that people are using the internet to commit crime in a very different way as to before. So it, it is almost hidden. But um, it, it's completely worrying that they're using it to manipulate our children, which, you know, which again, you know, it's something that we need to be entirely mindful of. I think parents need to be mindful of it. But I think there needs to be even wider education around how young people in particular use the internet. And not just young people, you know, the, you know older people um, are all ages are targeted by, uh, by these uh, type of perpetrators online. But no, I, I think he raises a very important point and it's something that you know, we will be looking at within the department. I call Joanne Dobson. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister outline her proposals for dealing with the many welfare issues affecting the Northern Ireland Prison Service, including the serious increase in mental health issues amongst officers? Minister. Um, Yes, of course. Um, now we, we are at the very early stages in terms of our thinking on how we deal with the welfare of our issues in relation to prison officers, particularly mental health, because I think earlier in question time the focus was around the mental health issues of prisoners, but I think you know, the, the member rightly points to the, the mental health issues around prison officers. Um, as I said earlier, um, working in a in the prison environment is like, um, you know, is like no other. Um, it's, it's, it's isolated, um, it's, it's challenging. And um, I, I think we need to pay due regard to the impact that that's having on uh, officers. Um, certainly we're looking at a modernization program, which again I alluded to earlier, which will look at how we can better support officers. You know, I mind that if we are going to look after and care for uh, prisoners uh, within, um, within uh, these establishments, that starts with looking after our prison officers. So um, I, I appreciate the question raised, and it is something that we're keen to do. But again, I'm quite happy to take the thoughts of other members, you know, and perhaps interactions they've had with the various people to, to inform me on this. Mrs. Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, can I thank the Minister for her answer? And she did confirm in an earlier, replied in an earlier question, that she, she will work with the Health Minister on this issue with regard to prisoners. Again, she worked with the Health Minister with regard to prison officers. Can I press her on what specific practical steps are in the pipeline to help prison officers? Oh, thank you. Um, again, uh, very, very early stages, but I would be minded to look at the, the particular patterns in which officers are working. Um, we're having an awful lot more prison officer, or female prisoner officer, officers and how that impacts on their family life. Um, I think just the general conversations and the engagement they have with hierarch hierarchy within the prison service. And there is an opportunity now um, uh, with the new director general, whoever he or she may be, to really implement that change and shift in mindset and about how we can better support our prison officers. Mr. Jay Kelly. Um, I think they asked the Minister would she uh, assure the Assembly that uh, mm -hmm. she will without delay implement the 63 recommendations that were brought in by the Ombudsman in the aftermath of the uh, life-changing um, injuries to Sean Lynch. I, I thank the member for his question and as I, I, I had said to uh, Mr Atwood earlier in, in question time, you know that this report does make for very, very difficult uh, reading and I, and I am very sorry that this happened to this young man. Um, you know, he's been left with life-changing injuries as you have alluded to um, and I think we do need to look at the processes. You know, certainly from our perspective the prison officer or the prisoner ombudsman's report has put forward 63 recommendations. Recommendations do not only fall within my remit um, but also within the remit of the South Eastern uh, Trust and we do need to look at those moving forward to see how we can best utilise them so that we don't have a circumstance like this again. Kelly? Uh, thank you, Minister, for the answer of tonight. Uh, if I could persist, uh, if, if there are a number of those uh, um, recommendations which uh, affect the Justice Department, will she come back to the Assembly and tell us of that? But also, uh, has she spoken to the family and have the authorities uh, apologised to uh, this young man uh, for the, uh, watching this, these injuries taking place over a full hour? Uh, in view of uh, prison officers? Um, no, I haven't met with the family of, of the man, but indeed I'm quite happy to meet with the family of the, of the young man if they, if they wish to uh, get in touch with the department. Indeed, I know my Director General had said that she was um, happy enough to meet with the family as well in terms of uh, this issue. Um, What's concerning about this for me, um, uh, Mr Kelly, is the fact that I don't believe that my officers were equipped in dealing with this very, very ser serious case of mental health issue problems. And I think moving forward, we need to look at that because thankfully this will not present itself very often, but the fact that it did um, um, is, is an issue for me and it's something that I'm keen to look at. Mr Paul Frew. Uh, can I ask the Minister that whilst we all recognise the judiciary as an independent body uh, free from uh, uh, political interference, there is indeed a belief out there in the unionist community that there is being a leniency shown towards distant Republicans. Can I ask the Minister, do you detect that belief and what can you do to reassure the community? Minister. 
I thank the, the member for his, uh, his question. Indeed, the, the public perception around this is quite worrying. Um, indeed, knowing a lot of information around this particular issue, I, I don't believe it's as biased as some may suggest. But I, I'm, again, you know, you've highlighted the independence of the judiciary, and I'm, I'm keen to always respect that. But I do have a good close working relationship with the Lord Chief Justice. And if this is a public perception issue, then I'm quite happy to, uh, to share these concerns on behalf of the Assembly with the Lord Chief Justice around this area. Mr. Frey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, given the fact that nearly every week we see in the written press uh, stories about changes of bail conditions, lenient bail conditions, uh, suspended sentencing, uh, compared to others uh, in the unionist community. Can I ask the Minister, have you conducted any sort of survey or investigation into uh, sentencing of late? And would that be something that the Minister could maybe take on in order to reassure the public? Minister. The member for supplementary. Um, again, um, be careful not to, to step on the toads of, of the, the judiciary on this area, but certainly we announced a sentencing review um, uh, just before summer recess that you know, hopefully will um, address some of these issues. But again, you know, taking the comments from members in this House, you know, I'm quite keen to, to uh, raise this as an issue with the Lord Chief Justice and, you know, and see how he can best take it forward. Thank you. Mr. Storey is not in his place. I call Mr. Alan Chambers. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, could I ask the uh, Minister for an update on the current situation uh, over the future use of the now redundant uh, courthouse in Bangor? Um, as the, the member will be aware, um, uh, the, the the courthouses are currently um, uh, pending court decisions, and at this stage it would be inappropriate for me to make a, a, a remark on, on that basis. Mr. Chambers. Could I ask the Minister if she would be able to share with me if she has been approached by any local groups about the future use of it, and uh, if she would be sympathetic to those approaches? No, um, indeed, a, a number of stakeholders uh, concerning all of the courthouses across Northern Ireland have approached me um, with their concerns about the court, um, the court estate. Um, and again, uh, pending the outcome of the court, because it, it would be um, difficult for me to say anything at this stage. But you know, I, I, what I would say is that I do encourage everybody to have an input in this. You know, um, again, these are buildings and they are towns within your constituencies, and by all means, if there's an input, if there's a better way to utilise them, I, I would be keen to hear that after the outcome of the court case, of course. I call Mr Declan McAleer. Is the Minister satisfied that suitable care policies and procedures are in place to support prisoners who have, uh, sp um, prisoners who have special mental health needs? Um, again, you know, just to come back to this area around mental health, to, to be honest, I'm not quite sure there are. Um, you know, to, to allude to comments to Mr Kelly earlier, you know, and equally I don't think prison officers are currently equipped to deal with uh, certain issues of um, mental health cases that present themselves within the prisons. Now, they, they do have training, you know, of course, they do have training around this area. But, you know, I think as mental ca health cases within prisons become more prevalent, I think we need to review that, and I think we need to look at the training and the care needs around that, and certainly it's something that I'm minded to do within, within the next five years. Mr. McAleer. Um, uh, Carmel, so, uh, as I'm just saying that you'd be minded uh, to look at the uh, training for prison staff to deal with the complex needs that, of many prisoners? Uh, yes, of course. Um, you know, the, there's kind of two strands to this. Um, it's, it's better supporting prison officers for, so that they are able to do this job, so that they do feel equipped to deal with situations as they arise. But it's also uh, coming back to look at the needs of people within custody and if we're best serving them. Um, mental health, again, um, is a shared responsibility between myself and the health minister. Um, we, we've already had those conversations up until now on, on how we can move forward on this. Um, our, our working relationship has actually been very positive because I think there's a keenness there to, to want to address this, not just within prison institutions, but sort of the wider criminal justice system as well. It does concern me that a lot of people that are coming into the criminal justice system do seem to present with some sort of mental health issue. Um, and that can derive from other uh, traumas or impacts that they've had in their life, including domestic violence, which is one of uh, the reasons why I'm keen to address it particularly. But everything goes hand in hand. And I think we could make really, really effective progress if we can have a cross-departmental approach in this. But it, the work's already begun. So. Mr. Andy Allen is not in his place. I call Mr. David Ford. Thank you, 
Deputy Speaker. Earlier, Nicola Mallon referred to the action plan, as she described it, which was produced by the executive in response to the panel on paramilitaries uh, and the report that they produced at the end of May. Um, given that some of us felt that the so-called action plan fell a long way short of an action plan in terms of targets, detailing of responsibilities and finance, could the Minister give us any update on what's happening within her department on it, please? Has the Minister provide a brief answer? Sure. Um, as I said at the time when the criticism came, that to expect any more, uh, to expect a fully costed, fully detailed plan at that stage in the limited time period that we have would actually be irresponsible. We are moving ahead on it. Uh, we have a design day to see how we can get into the detail, but work is ongoing, and I'm sure uh, we will have outcomes of that in the very near future. Thank you. Uh, we move on.